Hey everybody, it's Miss Audrey from the Fairfield County District Library at our downtown main location, and today we're talking about books! Yay! So last month was Women's History Month, and just because of the way things worked out, I didn't have a chance to talk about really awesome books starring girls, so I'm doing it this month instead. And um, here's my little stack. I decided this month, to, or this time around, to focus on historical fiction that features girls from around the world from really fascinating time periods uh, that have all come out in the last couple of years. And I'm going to start with the book I am currently reading. It's thick, but it's a much quicker read than you would think because a lot of it's told in poem form. And it takes place in ancient Greece during the Peloponnesian War. So during the time when Athens was fighting against Sparta. The two great city-states of Athens and Sparta were fighting against each other. And uh, it's really cool so far. I like this book quite a lot. The two main characters are only one of them's a girl and her name is Melisto and she is the daughter of a wealthy aristocrat from Athens. And the other main character's name is Raskos and he is a Thracian slave. His mother was um, a noble woman who was uh, captured during a war and enslaved and brought to um, Thessaly, which is north of Greece. And they haven't met yet, but they're going to in one form or another later in the book. I know that because it says so on the cover. Anyway, um, it's a little difficult to explain the plot of this one as you can see it's a little thick but it reads really fast um, basically Melisto doesn't fit in super great her mom wants her to be really good at girl stuff like weaving and household things and Melisto would rather be outside which Athenian girls didn't really spend a lot of time outside of the house it wasn't the woman's sphere to be outside and Roscoe's more than anything else he loves to draw specifically he loves to draw horses and they're both trying to work their way towards a place where they're more comfortable it can be more themselves that's what's going on right now um, and it's told between their two points of view but you also get the voices of Hermes and a couple of other gods what's interesting is early on in the book Raskos's mother is sold and then she becomes a slave in Melisto's household. So Raskos's mother raises Melisto and that's how they're initially tied together. And then they wind up tied together in other ways later on in the book. Um, another cool thing about the story is that periodically you see pictures and little descriptions of ancient Greek artifacts and things like that that add to the story and put it more in historical context. It's a hard book to, to explain and to describe, but it's very good. It reads very quickly. Anyone who's interested in ancient Greece, um, anyone who's interested in mythology, anyone who likes history would really get a lot out of this book. Um, there is a lot of, they do use the word womanish as an insult quite a lot, but the, the Greeks did that. There's a lot of explanation in the back matter or the details that they put in the back. It talks about some of the real people who um, show up in the book. There's a timeline, there's a bibliography, there's a lot of research that went into writing this book. So um, a lot of the biases and prejudices are, are in the book, uh, of the time are in the book and they're explained both in the text and in the back, which is pretty cool. So anyway, that's Amber and Clay by Laura Amy Schultz. Um, the next book that we read was by Gail Carson Levine. One of my favorite books as a kid was Ella Enchanted. And this is by the same author as Ella Enchanted. She's written loads of other stuff too, but this is different from everything else she's ever written. It's not fantasy at all. It's historical fiction. Um, it opens with a little rhyme. It goes, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. And in the self same year, it's true, Spain's king and queen expelled the Jews. So this is based off of Levine's own family history of how parts of her family were expelled from Spain in the late 1400s um, and had to go live elsewhere. 
Um, so we meet the main character, Paloma, or Loma, when she's seven, and we watch as she grows up to be about 16 years old. She's her abuelo, or her abuelo's, favorite grandchild, and she winds up traveling with him, which was very unusual for Jewish girls in Spain. Um, more than anything else, what Loma wants out of life is a husband and kids, which you don't actually see very often in historical fiction with girls, but it's very believable to Loma's character. But she sees how much her bello does for the Jewish community in Spain. He's a very wealthy and politically savvy businessman. He has the ear of the king and queen, and he does everything in his power to keep the local Jewish, well, the, the Spain, Spain's Jewish community safe. Um, there's always been a lot of anti-Semitism in the world, and he does what he can to protect the Jews. And by traveling with her Belo, she is uh, supporting him, and so she's also ultimately helping her community. So she puts what she wants on a personal level aside to help her grandfather help the community. And in the process, she turns out to be quite the diplomat and quite the problem solver in her own right. And so it's really cool to watch her grow up. I will acknowledge this is not the fastest paced book in the world, but that's not really what it's about. This book is great for kids who love history and love to feel like they're in it, who want to know what things felt like, what they smelled like, what living in that time period was really about. I also really loved um, seeing historical Jews in this historical time period that wasn't just the Holocaust, because that's usually where you see them. Um, I personally love this. I love history, so seeing something that was right on the cusp of medieval times in the Renaissance, I thought this was wonderful. I'd have eaten this with a spoon as a kid. Um, so for kids who don't mind a slightly slower paced read, this is awesome. Our next one was a much faster read. This is by Linda Sue Park, who is also an, a Newbery medalist. Um, and it takes place in the Dakota Territory in here in the U.S. in 1880. The author loved The Little House on the Prairie books when she was a girl, but um, Linda Sue Park is Korean American. And uh, she got to a certain age where she realized that that probably would have been a really difficult time and place to grow up as an Asian American. So this was um, her kind of answer to that a little bit. She was imagining what it would have been like to have been Asian American living in that time period and in that setting. Um, Korea wasn't super well known, so instead she made, by, in the Western world at that time, so she made her main character, Hannah, um, biracial Chinese American and white. Um, her mother, who was technically half Chinese, half Korean, but she identifies as being Chinese, um, has passed away and Hannah it has moved from the west coast farther east with her father and they're trying to settle down um, in the Dakota Territory. Uh, her father is a tailor and Hannah is a very talented seamstress and she wants more than anything else to help her father run the shop as a seamstress and he thinks she's too young. She's 14 in the book. Um, the book basically centers around Hannah trying to convince her father that she's grown up enough to be a seamstress and also how she navigates a very racist and frankly rather sexist patriarchal world. Um, her life's pretty rough. She doesn't have a lot of allies so she has to think about really hard before she acts and speaks. Um, but by the end of the book, she has found friends, she has carved out a niche for herself, she's proven herself to her father. Um, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that. It does end on a, on a happy note. It's a really quick read, and for people who love um, period details of how did they survive in that time period, like those nitty gritty details um, that are in Little House on the Prairie, they'd probably really like this book too. It's a very good book. The only slight negative is that Hannah does interact with some indigenous people a few times and they don't speak English and therefore they don't really come off as super well-rounded characters. They can't really speak for themselves and every other character is so deliciously full. That's just a little bit of a pity. So that's Prairie Lotus by Linda Super. Our next one is Orphan Eleven by Jennifer Choldenko. And this one takes place in Iowa, 1939. And the main character of this is Lucy. 
and she lives in a really rotten orphanage at the beginning of the story. And in the first couple of chapters, three, she and three other kids run away and they escape. And pretty quickly, they find themselves in a circus, hence the cover. And the circus has elephants. And Lucy's thrilled. She really likes the elephants. And Lucy manages to um, catch the eye of the lady, Grace, who is in charge of the elephants. The only trick is that to work with the elephants, you have to be able to talk. And Lucy has developed a truly deep-seated fear of speaking because of certain things that happened back in the orphanage. So Lucy has to try to master that in order to work with the elephants. Um, so while she's dealing with that, though, the ladies from the orphanage are trying really hard to find Lucy in particular. There's something about that orphan in particular that those ladies refuse to let go of. So that's a bit of a mystery. Um, yeah, it's a really good book. If, if you like the whole orphans run away and join the surfet, circus, like it sounds like a pretty traditional story, but at the same time, you don't actually see that very often in children's literature. So that's, that's a lot of fun. Um, when you find out why um, the, the ladies from the orphanage are so invested in Lucy and why she doesn't talk anymore, and you realize that it's based off of a true, true events, it's, it kind of takes your breath away because it's really quite, quite nasty, actually. But um, again, it has a happy ending. This one moves quite quickly. It's a pretty fast-paced story. Um, and it, there's some pretty great back matter on this one, too, about circuses and also, well, the, the part of the plot that I'm trying really hard not to spoil. So anyway, that's Orphan Eleven by Jennifer Cholbenko. So that, and that one, like I said, takes place in 1939. The next one takes place just one year later in 1950, but it's on the other side of the world in North Korea. This is Sora, and she was the best student in her school, but when on her 12th birthday, she's told she has to stay home to take care of her two little brothers, who are four and 10 years younger than herself. And Sora is upset. She wants to be a writer or a teacher. She's not that great at cooking, and she keeps being told sort of directly and indirectly that her brothers are more important than her, that boys are more important than girls, and that sons are more wanted than daughters. And it's kind of bringing her down. And at the same time, they're living in North Korea, which under that point was under communist rule, and it was really harsh and really difficult to live just to begin with. And then the Korean War starts and bombs start falling and it's bad. Eventually the family has to flee to the south. They have family that lives in the very southern part of South Korea in Busan, as the city of Busan. So they're fleeing down south to try to get there. But she and her next youngest brother, Young Soo, get separated from the family. And that's when it turns into a survivalist story where the two kids are trying to um, are trying to survive and trying to get south to be reunited with their family. And it's kind of brutal. There's a lot of death in this one. Um, if you have some more sensitive readers, um, maybe read it with them. Make sure they've got some tissues on hand. Um, but it's really, really good. Uh, I, I couldn't really put it down. It's based on the author's mother's family's story. Um, her mother was, in fact, separated from her family with one of her brothers while they were fleeing down south. It, there, again, it's, there, there's an author's note that talks about it in the back. There's a lot of really great back matter in all of these. Um, so yeah, this is a really good one and it's a really fast read. This is probably the most lighthearted book in my stack. It's called Planet Earth is Blue and it's by Nicole Pentelikos. And I really need to start looking up how to pronounce authors' names before I do these things. And it's focused around the 1986 Challenger launch. Uh, Nova is the main character and she loves space. She loves space. And she and her sister Bridget have been looking forward to this Challenger launch forever. Um, a teacher's going up into space and not astronauts going up into space for the first time. It's going to be televised. It's a whole big thing. The only trick though is that Bridget went missing 
And Nova's living with a new foster family, and so she's just hoping that Bridget can find her. One of the best things about this book is the main character. Nova is an autistic child who is nonverbal, and she helps tell the story. Um, about half of it is in the form of letters to her sister Bridget that obviously she can't send, but still it helps her process her thoughts, and it gives the reader a really great insight into how her mind is working and I love how distinct the letters feel from the rest of the text. It's really great. The author herself is neurodiverse and is a teacher who has worked with autistic children for most of her career so she's got some real insight into what she's writing about which is awesome. Um, so most of the story is about adjusting, Nova adjusting to her new school and her loving family and her communicating her life to Bridget and waiting for Bridget to come home and also getting really excited for the Challenger uh, launch, which of course um, we all know doesn't really go to plan. Um, the school, since it's set in 1986, there are some outdated terms and therapies that the school uses that we now know aren't particularly beneficial. And again, it's they're mentioned in the author's note in the back. Um, but for the most part, it's a pretty positive book. Nova's foster family loves her and cherishes her and considers her to be a very much wanted part of their family. And it's really nice too. So Planet Earth is Blue. I love that one. My last book also takes place in 1986, which is starting to give me a complex because I was born in 1986. Um, and it's the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in April 1986. The two main characters of this book are Valentina, who is from a Jewish family, and Oksana, and um, who has not a great home life. And they live in Pripyat, which is the village right next to the Chernobyl power plant. And their, their fathers work there, and after the meltdown, they are evacuated, they have to leave. Um, due to reasons, Oksana cannot go, cannot be evacuated with her mother. There's no one else to take her, and even though she's been raised to hate Jews, Valentina's mother is a very sweet woman who takes Oksana with them, and then Oksana winds up going with Valentina to live with Valentina's grandmother, or Balbuya. So, um, most of the story is actually really about finding found family and tr what true friends mean and finding hope when things are not so great. Um, and like how to stand up for yourself and how to keep going. Those are all pretty major themes in the book. Um, and how to overcome differences and make friends with people who, who are different from you. Um, the story's told, it it's alternates points of view between Oksana and Valentina. They're not narrating the story, but it, it focuses very much on them. Their chapters focus on them and what's going through their heads and their backgrounds and stuff like that, and they feel very distinct. And then you get the occasional um, flashback to another young lady, Rivka, who was 12 years old in 1941 during World War II when she had to flee Kiev to run away from the Germans. So you learn a lot about communism in this book. I've never read a lot of books set in Soviet Russia, so that was new for me. And um, this was another one that was really hard to put down. Um, it was a very atmospheric read. So there we go, some really good books. Not necessarily the lightest hearted reads ever. Um, there, there are some pretty hefty, hefty themes in all of these, I have to say, but they're all very, very good. And hopefully there's something in there that'll catch your attention. Thanks for tuning in guys. And please remember we're open to the public now, but if you come to visit us in person, you do have to wear a mask at all times that covers your nose and the face, nose and your mouth when you're inside the building. Thanks everybody, we'll see you next time. Bye.